What happens if, as our critics propose, we just walk away from a plan that the rest of the world were to deem to be reasonable? And that could happen. Well, the talks would collapse. Anybody standing up in opposition to this has an obligation to stand up and put a viable, realistic alternative on the table. And I have yet to see anybody do that. America is mired in a difficult and perhaps even dangerous relationship with Iran. In one case, we're working with them to defeat an evil government. In another case, we're fighting against them by proxy. And all this while we decide whether to trust them with the possibility of a nuclear weapon. So how do you solve a problem like Iran? One man says open the bomb doors and lay down the ordnance. Now. Answering that call is our next guest. He is the principal author of the shock and awe bombing concept. Senior advisor to the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. Let's welcome back Harlan Ullman in the midpoint. Harlan, thanks for being here. Uh, good to be with you, Ed, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. In the International New York Times, here it is. This is the word from John Bolton, who should know a little bit about being an ambassador and a little bit about international politics. He's been there. His quote, the inconvenient truth is that only military action like Israel's 1981 attack on Saddam Hussein's Osirak reactor in Iraq or its 2007 destruction of a Syrian reactor designed to build by North Korea can accomplish what is required. Time is terribly short, but a strike can still succeed. You agree or disagree? Mr. Bolton is entitled to his own opinion, but I think what he is proposing is close to criminal stupidity. Not because we don't have to consider the possibility of a military strike, but you cannot think about a military strike without asking what are the likely consequences. Mr. Bolton, as you know, was one of the advocates and architects of the March 2003 intervention in Iraq, which I think was the biggest foreign policy disaster in our history. They never asked the what next question. And so before we start considering using force, what are the consequences? Because in essence, we will be declaring war on Iran because not only will we be going after their nuclear facilities, we will have to take out a good portion of their air defenses and other conventional forces, and that is going to get a retaliatory series of strikes by Iran. We need to know what that's likely to be and how we are able to deal with it before we make the decision to go to war, if indeed we do. So I cannot disagree more with Mr. Bolton's proposal. Harlan, is it just possible, though, that a government like Iran only understands war, shrapnel, and bodies flying before they're willing to do something that would bring them back into accordance with the rest of the world? I have to realize... Persian personalities here. If we attacked Iran, we probably would turn the bulk of the 80 million Persians against us. Uh, during the Iran-Iraq war that went on for nearly nine years, Iran was prepared to take a million casualties. Remember, we supported Iraq in those days. Mm -hmm. My point is, if we are going to attack, we have to assume the very first. Now, we may be at a stage where we have to make that consideration, but Iran could easily close or threaten to close the Strait of Hormuz, which would cause a huge spike in oil price, which the Russians would love and Iran would like. They could take action using Hezbollah and Shia militia in Iraq. They could launch a strike against Bahrain. They could attack Saudi Arabia. They could attack Israel. There are many things that they could do. We have to realize that they get a vote in this. Now, we could get to a stage where we may see there's no other option, but to recommend that, that we're examining the consequences and preparing for those consequences, to me, is dereliction of duty. I want to go back to the word you used earlier. You did use the word stupid in one sense to discuss exactly what we're talking about here. So I guess my next question then is, and to follow up on what you said about we never consider what is going to be next after we go into one of these, these theaters, if you will, how can we, after all these years of leaving so many governments in tatters and having to go in and pick up the pieces, be so stupid as to not learn from our mistakes? Um, as you know, Ed, my latest book, uh a handful of bullets, how the assassination of Archduke Fran Franz Ferdinand still menaces the peace, argues that every war we started, Vietnam, the second Iraq war, and Afghanistan after we shifted away from the hunt for al-Qaeda, we've lost. And it's incredible. Is this in our DNA? Because successive administrations do not seem to learn. And one of the problems is, certainly for the last three presidents, we have elected president for prime time despite whatever qualifications they had, they were not prepared to be presidents. They just lacked the experience. And so I think as long as that continues, we run the risk of starting wars again without examining all the likely consequences, intended or otherwise. And I do not know how we can put that back into our DNA because, for example, Congress really lacks the leadership 
to be able to ask those questions. If you look back at Congress 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, there were really some great men, men of stature. And we're stature in Congress. Today is virtually no leadership. So one of the things that worries me is that we could easily get stuck into a conflict that we didn't fully understand. And as we learned in Iraq the hard way in 2003, it turned out to be a disaster. When you're talking about a lot of these men here, you're talking about guys who I guess, and, I, and I'm going to just extrapolate here, that they don't understand the military. They don't understand military tactics. They don't understand war tactics. And that would possibly be a good part, certainly of the executive branch, but certainly Congress as well. Is that the biggest issue that we have here then, Harlan? Our leaders don't want to, nor do they need to, they feel, understand what military tactics are. I think the problem is that White Houses have become successively isolated. The size of the National Security Council staff is between four and five hundred or maybe more. Not only do they coordinate policy, they set policy and they execute policy, which really cuts out the various cabinet secretaries. But shouldn't they be listening to all these people though, Harlan? They have a tremendous amount no, of help there. Not really. I mean, most of the time that people spend is wasted in, in committee meetings that really don't achieve much. You need decision but you need the military to strong up, stand up much more strongly, as well as the civilian leadership. But when you're in the White House, people are cowed by being in the, in the uh, president's cabinet room, it being in the presence of a president. And too often the ideology of the particular president carries the day, and people are just really very reluctant to stand up. Do we still then in many ways, and I guess I'm going to do this with a, a few seconds that we have left then, in your opinion, do we have people who are, just want to be president and just want to have that adulation and then really don't know nor understand what it means to lead a country? I think that's unfortunately true. As long as we continue to elect presidents who lack the experience, you know, there's going to be a lot, a lot of uh, training. But at that stage, it may be too late. When you take a look at Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama, they have made similar mistakes because they lack the experience. I got about 20 seconds left here, Harlan. Is there anyone sitting out there right now that you think who could be president who would understand it? John Kerry, but John is not running. And I think that beyond John, it would really be hard pressed for me to find someone who is likely to run that fits the bill on either side, of Republicans or Democrats. And that is going to have to be the last word, but that is a frightening word. Uh, I understand that uh, Mr. Bolton is taking a lot of heat for this uh, very interesting well, editorial well, as well. And, I, and I'm sure he's going to hear this as well. Harlan Ullman, it's always fascinating to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your opinions. Ed, thank you very much. All right, take care. After the break, our weekly waste. Not of time. But in noting how your government fritters away billions of dollars of your cash every single day, and they do it automatically, sort of like an ATM. That's coming up on Midpoint.